Right, Ron, Mikey K, welcome to the virtual HR studio, mate. Absolute pleasure. I think we've been, we've been trying to line this up for about a year, maybe. Yeah, well, you've been trying to get me into your studio um, for about a year, and I live in Paris, and I've been doing a lot of traveling and the COVID filmmaking and stuff, so it's been virtually impossible without getting 1,400 PCR tests to come and see you, and 3,000 pounds, which is what 1,400 PCR tests probably cost. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but no, mate, it's great to be... Um, it's great to be uh, having a chat with you. And uh, we, we most recently had a chat about um, a, a turp I was trying to get out of Afghanistan. And you very kindly um, jumped on that pretty quickly and started trying to um, utilize and leverage some of your contacts. I, mean, I really appreciate that. Yeah, no worries, mate. No, I mean, what, 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 what are you going to do when people ask questions like that, right? For help, flipping like my situation. But what it did, what in, what it did do actually is. Um, expose your knowledge and uh, a level of knowledge and experience of those kind of operations uh, from your past. Obviously, helicopter pilot, uh, you're a journalist now, you're a filmmaker now, you're a bunch of stuff now. Um, previous military life as a heli pilot with the RAF, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was with the RAF. But I, I tell you what, we didn't, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're in the RAF and you're a helicopter pilot and you're a fast jet pilot or a, AT pilot, a hurt pilot, you're, you're completely separate because as a heli pilot, you work under the JHC, the Joint Helicopter Command, and that's all, that's all, it's a very different experience to being in the true Air Force Blue environment. So I spent most of my time working with Army and Navy, um, which was more fun, to be honest. You know, the joint environment, you know, had a lot, a lot of problems when it, when it first sort of came about. The idea of working in joint environments is, is a fantastic idea, but you all work off different SOPs, you all work off different radios, different technology. You mean uh, joint, joint with other nations, right? No, 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 no. Joint as in with, with the okay. British Army and the Navy. I mean, even, okay. even that idea of jointry back then when it was, it was starting to become a thing was, was difficult when it first started because, you know, the Army Air Corps do fly in a completely different way. The Navy fly in a completely different way, the jungly force. Give me an example. Um, Give me an example of how the, the basic flying techniques differ. Well, it's just the tactics, training, and procedures. You know, the, the radio RT will be different. The uh, you know, the way that you you drop troops off at a, a target will be different. Uh, the way that you actually fly in formation will be different. Um, the briefings will be different. You know, for me, when you're flying with other people, that's formation flying, and that's actually a a massively, you know, the, getting the ESSA, the standard operating procedures right on a, on a formation sort of absolutely key because there's obviously more than one of you in the air. You don't want to clatter into someone. So, you know, that those briefings and those standard operating procedures were, were very, very different. And, you know, rightly so, because the Army operate on the battlefield and, you know, the Air Force operate sort of everywhere and the Navy mostly operate off carriers. So, you know, I, under, I understood it. But when, when you're all coming to work together on what's called Cameos, which are these composite air packages. Um, you know, it's important that everyone's tuning in on the same frequency, talking the same language, uh, understanding, you know, what the, the approaches are to certain targets and, and you know, how threat assessment, uh, how to operate the self-defense systems, whether it's chaff, flare, IRJ, guns out the doors. You know, there's so much that can go wrong when you're flying at low level and helicopters in a formation. It's it's and it, and it has happened, you know, during the Gulf War, there were a couple of collisions and a lot of people died. There was that CH-46 with, with British Marines on that, that flew into the ground, sea fit, control flight into the terrain. You know, it's just helicopters and, you know, uh, they, they try and kill you. Um, they're not stable. And so you've got to be on your game. And when there's more of you in the same bit of airspace, you just got to be on the same page. I didn't realise that. For some reason, in the back of my mind, I thought that that... that flying would be would be have been standardized those ttbs would be standardized because of the necessity for or because it'd be based on the safety aspect because of the helicopters like you're saying they flip flipping death traps it's like you know the rotor stop turning or don't turn properly <laughs> there's no way out of that <laughs> i've got i got a caveat this though i got a caveat this though you in my in my 20 years of flying i never ever once had an incident um but they will bite you. People say to me now, they say to me, like, oh, you know, do you still fly now? And I'm like, fuck no. And they're like, why not? you got like two and a half thousand hours flying, you know, you've been doing it for 20 years. I said, you know, look, to fly helicopters, 
Um, you've got to be doing it every day. You've got to be able to trust the engineers that are working on it every day. Uh, and you've got to keep yourself familiar. And it's not just about taking an, aer an airplane flying. You know, you've got the ability to punch into cloud, transfer on our instruments, dial up Bristol Airport, jump onto the instrument landing system, get a cloud break, re-enter into it at low level, fly at 50 feet, get into twilight, put the night vision goggles on, deal with the, civil t the twilight bit where you don't have enough light to not have the goggles on, but it's not dark enough to put the goggles on. Um, you know, all of that stuff will kill you if you don't get it right. You go into cloud and you're not trained properly, you can end up upside down in a heartbeat. You fly at low level at 50 feet and you haven't been doing it for a while, you can bounce off a mast or into some wires in a heartbeat. And I've got friends that have done all that and I've got friends that have killed themselves doing that, uh, you know, through my years. So that's why I don't do it now. It's a young man's game and it's a, it's a, it's a frequency game. Talk to me about your experience of um, hostile environment type evacuation. Then, when did you first well, get involved in that stuff? Yeah, so I I had the wonderful going back to the joint the joint piece. Um, when I got promoted to major, I had the opportunity to go on to the joint uh, the joint force headquarters JFHQ, which is based at PGHQ, um, and it was probably one of the best tours outside of flying. No, it was the best tour, and it actually competed with a lot of the flying tours because of what we got to do. I was working for uh, the, the number two in the, the JFHQ at the time was a guy called Gordon Messenger, Royal Marine. don't know if you ever heard his name, but, you know, one of the most personable, capable operators, humble operators, uh, and just all-round brilliant human beings I've ever met. Like, became a really good mate. He went on to become VCDS, first Royal Marine, first Royal Marine to become a four-star. Four Should have got CDS without a shadow of doubt, but politics at that level um, sadly didn't go Gordon's way. But, um, you know, ended up working for him for two years. And uh, one of my jobs as the air specialist was uh, to go through CCPs and JCP, civil contingency plans and joint contingency plans, um, which involved neo style planning non-combatant evacuation operation style planning um flew down to the falklands for two weeks we went and revamped the jcp there which was basically what happens if we need to get uh you know british entitled people out of that place if we have another scenario where argentinians sort of decide to um knock on the door again um evacuation planning for Bolivia. Bolivia is a really interesting one because uh, I remember this from all the planet. La Paz is at a really high altitude. So you couldn't actually get at the time a C-130 into the um, into the altitude at La Paz. Uh, what's, what's, the, what's the significance of La Paz? What, what, who's there? The altitude, the density altitude. No, but who's there? Like oh, La, pa there? La Paz is the capital of, of Boliz Bolivia. Sorry, okay. Right. Sorry, yeah, yeah, no, sorry. And so... <clears throat> And what was happening is there was a lot of unrest at the time in the past. So we get put onto this, you know, we're, what we're doing is we're monitoring, you know, the JFHQ is this awesome organization and it monitors uh, everything that's going on around the world. And, it, and, and it, as soon as there are certain triggers on the, on the, on the indicators and warnings, you know, you start having a look at various evacuation plans to make sure that the last time it was looked at, it's up to date and it's good to go. I, and so, you know, you do La Paz and you look at it and it's fascinating, you know, because you have to use airfields down by the ocean because when they're down by the ocean, the altitude is less. It means, you know, you can lift more going out. And if, if you can lift more going out and get Chinooks to bring them into the airport, then, you know, that's a, that's a more efficient and effective way of doing an evacuation than having a small amount of people at the actual location. This should be all ringing true now when you think in Kabul, right? Why was fucking Bagram shut? Why did they shut Kandahar? Um, you know, the threat assessments. And this is what this is what I was doing. And then I got, there was a trigger pull to go to, uh, we deployed very quickly to Ghana, deployed to Accra, and then we bounced into Cote d'Ivoire because we had to get the people, the Brits out of the, em and, and entitled persons out of the embassy in Cote d'Ivoire. We had to do it quickly and we did it with SF. So, you know, this is where my experience of NEOs came from. And, and what was making me laugh is, is that Kabul wasn't called a NEO. I don't think ever, I don't think anyone ever called it a NEO from politicians down to media. It was a non-combatant evacuation operation and it should have been treated as a non-combatant evacuation operation right from the outset. Um, but there were conditions 
from the former administration, the Trump administration, that led to the power vacuum that we saw without the government of Afghanistan and without all of that training, that blood. I mean, I, did, I, did you deploy to Afghanistan? Yeah. Yeah, right. When, were you in training and mentoring or were you in war fighting down in Helmand? War fighting at Helmand and other places. Right, because I was on the prelim ops team for that. Me and Gordon Messenger and seven other people went out and we wrote the campaign plan across the political, the economic, the security and narcotics lines of development. General Mike Jackson came in to authenticate it. What year was that? That was 2005, October. Goodness me, I need to pick your brains on that at some point. Right. Well, Ed Ed Butler came in (laughs) and completely blew it out of the water. Um. And I, I, and I know from, you know, following it very, very closely that it was a hornet's nest when, uh, was it three power? Yeah. Yeah. Went let's, in let's, come, let's come back to that. I definitely want to talk to you about that. Um, let's come back to Kabul. So, um, only because we go down a rabbit hole there, which I'm yeah. quite happy to go down that rabbit hole, but let's stay on the Kabul rabbit hole at the moment. Yeah, yeah. So that, I mean, so that's where I got my, that's why, you know, the BBC have been tapping into expertise <clears throat> on that and, you know, all these questions have been asked about, you know, why was Kabul the, the APOD, the airport departure that was selected? Why wasn't Bagram kept open? Why didn't we secure Kandahar? Um, why weren't there Chinooks being used to actually take the entitled personnel out to where the uh, APOD was? Why wasn't all of the um, selection process and the authentication process of people that were entitled to get out? Why wasn't that conducted outside of the airport and well away from the airport? You know, all of these things that just why didn't why weren't they treating it as a neo in the first place? Then what's the reason for that? No, or were didn't. they treating it as a neo, just not using the terminology? Uh, well, it was an evacuation to all intents and purposes. Um, why? Why it wasn't? It was just. It just. It just felt like everything was on the back foot, and and they were on the back foot because of the capitulation of the provinces across Afghanistan. So I just don't have experience with neos. As I alluded to earlier, um, I spent almost a year in Afghanistan in 2005 and 2006. The first time I was there was I was parachuted in by Jacko Page, who was the one star in charge of the Joint Force Headquarters. And I went, was called in by a two star tanky called Peter Gilchrist um, to go and lead a study or coordinate a study for Peter Gilchrist, who was doing it for the commanding general, which was a US general called Carl Eikenbury, and Carl Eikenbury was one of the significant US generals who played a big part in where Afghanistan is today. He then went on to become the US ambassador. And we led a study, or I coordinated a study with a lot of US generals flying around the five Afghan National Army corps in Afghanistan to understand how they were doing. The Afghan National Army was Carl Eikenbury's baby. He was the guy that went, look, we need to pull together an army here if Afghanistan is going to nation build that's another conversation we shouldn't have gone down the nation building route but so that was my first bit and then i bounced from there down to to kandahar with gordon messenger to do the prelim ops war fighting plan um to understand exactly you know what helmand was um helmand's very different as you know hugh from the other provinces in afghanistan because it's got a river running down the middle of it and if you've got a river, river running down the middle of a promise it means there's probably fertile soil and if there's fertile soil that probably means opium is rife and if opium's right, the Taliban are going to want to hold on to that because that's what bankrolls them. So, you know, there's all of this stuff about how that operated, how the tribal elders worked. Um, you know, I find myself up in Goresh speaking to ODA, ODA, the USSF. They've been operating out of Afghanistan since 2001. We were there in 2005. You know, and they've been doing SNR and SNI for four years, surveillance and reconnaissance and support and influence, non-kinetic SF operations. But effectively, they were... You know, working with tribal elders, they were the guys that were there doing the JTAC role, which is the Joint Terminal Air Controller, um, you know, enabling US air power to put precision strikes in on certain targets, AQ targets. Um, And they were paying off Afghan militia to to effectively do the force protection for the force they were working out. So there was was a lot of work that needed to be done. And when I when I got on the ground in Kandahar, Camp Bastion was an ISO container with a portaloo next to it. And, you know, for those that have been based at Camp Bastion, you know, later on, it, it turned into a city. You know, that's, that's the level of effort and, and pre-planning that was required in order to get British troops into home. Let's do the rabbit hole then. So why, <laughs> so when you got pulled into um, Helmand in 2005, 
what do you know what the high level objective was before the detail planning came that you were there to be part of? Do you know what the high level objective was of the intent of US UK being in there from yeah. five onwards? Yeah. At that, at that point, what was it? Hundred percent. The military was there in a supporting role to the State Department and the FCO, and the State Department's mission was to extend centralized governance from Kabul out to the provinces, the districts, and the shuras. That was the mission. Provide security to allow that governance to exist. And when we say governance, we you know, it's like diplomacy, elections. It's effectively trying to superimpose a ram, a Western um, democratic template onto a country that has never, ever existed as a sovereign entity, but as tribal entities that transcend national boundaries. And that was always, always, always going to be a virtually impossible thing to do. And when I look back on it, and I've spoken to Gordon Messenger about this, you know, decentralized governance should have been the way if we were ever going to try and get involved in that sort of, you know, rebuilding a country thing. It was, it was decentralized governance that played into the autonomy of tribes operating in various parts in the north and the south uh, of Afghanistan that, that should have been the way forward. Not trying to superimpose something that, that you know, tribal entities over in Herat or well over into the west of the country had no fucking interest of, of being part of. I think it's only impossible if you constrain yourselves by, by uh, uh, impossible timelines and not, and not think to yourself, this isn't going to take five years, 10 years, 15, maybe even 20 years. It's going to take a lot longer. So, so there must have been a misunderstanding of of how how much influence could be exerted on the population or misunderstanding of what what the culture was there yeah the and huge, elsewhere huge spot on you've got the watches we've got the time yeah All right now everyone says that Mullah Roma is the you know the former <laughs> Taliban head who's dead now said that I don't think he did say that but I think you know Chinese whispers and everything else and but it's absolutely true that the moral component of the electorate that votes for the for the invading um, government, for the invading country's government, will always break before the will of the insurgents inside a country where they live. Hundred percent. We saw it in Vietnam. We've seen it in pretty much every counterinsurgency operation since. Um, my ma, you know, it's. I can't think of a single counterinsurgency where we've, um, where we've been successful. Enlighten me if you if you know of any. Well, I'm interested you should say that. Yeah, Malaya, Malaya's one. Since Malaya, sorry, I said my. Oh, Myanmar. since Malaya, yeah. Sorry, okay, well. since Malaya, yeah. Sorry, I said my. Since Malaya, I can't think of any any counterinsurgency that's been successful. Now, if you look at. You know, you might say, well, what about the Caliphate, Islamic State? You know, they, they operated on, a, on an idea of holding territory. Al-Qaeda don't operate on an ideology of holding territory. And that's why Al-Qaeda still exists. And that's why Al-Qaeda is still massively dangerous. As are Islamic State. But Islamic State had this idea of building territory around the Caliphate. And that is much, much harder to, uh, you know, the whole... Petraeus adage, clear hole build. You know, you can clear something, but then it takes a shitload of troops working on the defensive attack ratio of one to three that we're all taught about, right? Um, you know, if you're an attacking force, you need three times the amount of force structure to get to become successful than a defending force. The ratio is usually three to one. Um, to hold that, you know, to clear it, to hold it, and to build on it are, are very different things. And I think that's, um, you know, that's where we made the mistake. How did, um, in 05, in that planning, how did, they, how did they intend the troops, as in me and my mates, <laughs> going in 06, how did they intend three para, 16-hour assault brigade to go about, oh, that, not the brigade, the battle group, to go about the business in 06 when you were, when you were planning it in 05? Because you mentioned earlier, Ed Butler changed the goalposts in 06. 
Yeah, I, and, and you're getting into territory which, and conversations which existed at a much, I was a major then, and those conversations existed at Gordon's level and higher. And I know Gordon was quite frustrated by the sort of do your own thing once the brigade entered the province. Um, so for example, and you, you will be able to, you, you will be able to um, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but your, your policy, if you like, your strategy was to, or Ed Butler's strategy was to go into those Taliban strongholds, the towns, and, and hold them, and hold them under intense fire. Um, well, initially it was to go in and uh, push them out and then deny them re-entry is what I try, and, right. I, I, I try and, I'm trying to remember it a long time ago. It is, that's yeah. what I think it was. But so, so there was a, a significant amount of casualties sustained because of that. And I think the big question was, is that what, what are you achieving by holding on to those, those areas of, and those pockets of ground um, and the casualties that you're losing, what, what are you actually achieving by that? Because it wasn't deterring the Taliban. They just kept coming and coming and coming. And I've got mates who flew the Chinooks into hot LZs that talked about red mist. It was just a, it, it seemed an unwinnable fight or it seemed a fight for, we weren't quite sure what the, res, the, the results were. Was it worth what the results were giving? I think was the question that was being asked. And, you know, people were asking culturally, what is the significance of holding on to these pockets versus making sure that you've got a core that is held and then whatever happens outside of that is kind of like, you know, because, you know, I mean, Afghanistan's terrain is unforgiving. And you've got to ask yourself, you know, there are tribal entities that exist in certain parts of a valley or whatever that don't have any real strategic significance on what the overall campaign is. I think those are the questions that were being asked. And the, and the danger and the threat that you guys on the ground were, were being put in. And by the way, um, and I'll say this now, it's at the top of my mind, is that I've got, I've got nothing but respect for the infantry and, and, and guys like you that walked on the ground, that put one foot in the front of the other every day across those fields, not knowing whether you were going to step on a, a dodgy mine or an IED. I, I, I was never put in that position. I was always the person in the air dropping people in, albeit a different risk. But I never had to deal with what you and the likes of Mark Ormrod had to deal with. And I got nothing but respect for you guys that had to do that for six months tours and do it day in, day out. That to me, when you talk about mental agility and, and how you overcome that type of adversity to me is like phenomenal. It's easy when you don't have a choice. What choice you got? No, but I, I, I'd ask you. I'd ask you. I mean, like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna turn the tables on you for two seconds here. Like, you're going out on a patrol. You've had mates that have been fragged the day before or three days before. That you've probably had to do some form of triage on or whatever. Get your fucking hands really dirty. How do you then? mentally put that in the back of your mind and focus on the job at hand rather than worrying about your own personal safety how did you, how did you do that how did you overcome that because that's the bit that gets me it's easy when you've got a distraction and the distraction is i was a commander and i had a little deep sense of responsibility to my guys and i believe that uh what did you tell them you though you know i mean that's what you think but what did you tell them like what was, your, what was your guidance? What was your D&G to them before you went out? I think you just get on with it. You get on with it. I don't know. I was, I was super lucky, especially in that tour and all, all, all three of the, the times I went out there. Very lucky. You know, I had very good guys. But I, I, you know, I, was in a, I was in a prestigious subunit of, you know, three para. And so I was blessed with a selection of very good very very good very capable already very very resilient not that soldiers in general are very resilient anyway but i sort of had the, 
the pick of the bunch, if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, so we got on with it. That's not to say it wasn't without effect uh, or impact on them, but you know, no, I, don't I, think, uh, I don't think it's a lot easier when you're a commander. You've got a responsibility. Um, uh, going back, sorry, we, we digressed there. So, I mean, I think perhaps I'm, I'm speculating here that that go out and seize key sort, sort of key areas, vital ground, if you like. My, maybe it was a, maybe it was um, in hindsight a bad move. It was obviously a bad move, but maybe the intent was to go and secure areas where that key leader engagement was needed with significant persons to secure access to those that governance side of 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 the of the province. I don't know. I'm speculating. I don't know, but I do remember. I mean, I've talked about this a few times over recent podcasts. It's like I. <clears throat> interested to you you there repeat what the in, the strategy was or the intent was of that op because i completely forgotten and i couldn't tell you what it was on the second time went out in 08 and i couldn't tell you what the intent was as in the overall the mission of the operation was in 2010 when i went out the third time and those should be ingrained in me i should know those even though they should have been ingrained in me why why weren't they certainly the first tour i probably forgotten you know what i mean just in the way that that tour was but i don't know it's hard to tell um, well, that was the, the the governance component was the was the was the grand strategic sort of you know mission. It, it it all sort of fed into the nation building component, which we should have never have have, have got into. Um, did we bite off more than we could chew? Uh, it's not the first time we've been in Afghanistan. It's not the first time we've seen. Uh, a superpower get knocked out of Afghanistan. I mean, they, you know, they, it all happened in the 80s when the Soviets were in there. But then you start, you, then you start getting, we haven't talked about this, but then you start getting into narcotics. You start getting into the corruption that comes from the narcotics. And, and I think the corruption side was underestimated in terms of it's a cancer that runs through the country, that it's a stage four cancer. You can't get it. It's spread. You know, you can't put the country under chemo. You can't put it under radio. There's nothing that can get rid of that. And they don't perceive it as, as, as uh, oh God, I just lost the word. They don't perceive it as corruption either. It's the same no. problem. In, it's the same problem in Africa and other parts of Asia and parts of South America. What we perceive as corruption is based on our experience of what, uh, what society should look like. What yeah. they would describe corruption as is culture. <laughs> That's the culture. Yeah, yeah, it's like, no, exactly. It's yeah, you know, exactly. It's, it's what it is. Yeah, yeah. And I think the um, you know, the, the most one of the most important things that come comes from that is is that it affected everything, everything from political level all the way down to the troop on the ground, um, in terms of what we were trying to achieve. Um, and and the sad thing about this, Hugh, is is that is that I don't think we'll learn from history. You know, I, I really don't think that education will take place um, because political governments change every four or eight years. And, and it's, you know, dare I say it, it's the same thing that happened in the military. You know, you, you go on a two-year staff tour, you, you'd be promoted probably, you think you could change the world, and then someone, in comes, to, someone comes and replaces you two years later and decides to do something else. So there's no consistency, there's no continuity, and there isn't at the political level uh, because there's too many agendas. So you never get a nice thread of consistency where lessons are learned and they're built upon. And so you keep making the same mistakes. It's madness. Yeah, I completely agree. Completely agree. I mean, on the political side uh, and the military side, the and I understand that the reason for the length of appointments in the military, it's, it's a different question, but on the, on the political side, you're right. One massive, one massive problem is the length of term of whenever a premier is, whenever a premier is in charge of whatever country you're talking about. In an ideal world, what I think it should be a 10 year term. And when you, oh, oh, oh. it should be, a, but listen, but listen, oh, 10 years should be a ten, oh. and we're talking, but we're talking, you know, we're talking, I'm not going to let granular detail here. But imagine if it was a 10-year term, right? And imagine that if the at the point you were elected to office, then the promises that you made during your campaign, okay, were you were held to account for those. And they were like re review stages throughout the 10-year term. Uh, 
and if you were found to not be achieving them or not on there'd be some measure of it if you don't not be achieving them then they risk being having another election or if it was like sig significant enough it could be some kind of flipping criminal repercussion maybe not criminal but some other repercussion maybe not on the individual but on the party civil repercussion you don't know because then what, what that would make sure is that the the promises that they're making in the campaign build up they're smart specific measurable achievable realistic and timely and not fluffy and the things they actually think they can achieve and they're not and, lying and you get a younger premier. <laughs> no. Yeah, so I think that's my ideal world. Solved it. We fixed it. We fixed I think it. Hugh's, I think Hughes' utopia is like let's ten, let's, let's let's put that let's put that there. A, a ten-year CEO is a different question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there are nuances to that, right? Because in any in any form of government, you should have a Congress that have the power to vote on past laws on. And this is one of the big differences between the US and the UK is. The UK voted in Parliament to go into Iraq, and they voted on airstrikes in Syria. Remember that, right? The US is very different. I've lived in, I've been reporting on the US. I lived in New York for six years, and I'm reporting on, on US politics for a while, specifically when it comes to foreign policy and defense. The bit with the US is, is that in 2001, they voted upon what's called an AUMF, which is the Authorization for the Use of Military Force. So what that gave, and still to this day gives, is executive power for any president of the United States to invade and occupy any country without having to pass that through Congress. And that under is what, under what premise? Or what's the reason that they War can do terror. it? War, War terror. terror. So the, A, the AUMF was signed, and then for the next 20 years, America can do what the fuck it wants, where it wants, doesn't have to pass anything through Congress, and it's budgeted for. Fucking madness. Absolutely <laughs> yes. And they can't change it. And they've been trying to change it to take away the power from the executive. But it hasn't been changed yet. And so they're, you know, you, they're the nuances you get into when you start talking about democracy and, and the way that you know, wars are started and wars are finished and all the rest of it. It's, that AUMF is a, is a, is a ball and chain um, around, uh, you know, around, around US policy at the moment. And that needs to be done. The UK, you know, still has to vote. And then you start talking about whether a, a, you know, a, um, a party has a majority or whether it's a coalition. If it's a coalition, it's obviously better because that means that you're going to get a sort of, you know, a, a more diverse view. So all these things start coming into account. And as we know at the moment, Boris has got the majority. So. Um, how are they trying to change that in the States then? Who's trying to change it? Uh, there are certain senators, there are certain Congress people that are leading on a bill to try and change the um, the AUMF, but ultimately it's got to be voted upon. And because because of the bipart because of the partisan politics in the US at the moment, what they do with bills in the US is they attach all sorts of other things when they when they're trying to push the the bill through. You don't like they don't just vote on the infrastructure bill; they attach all sorts of policy, you know, with the economy or immigration or whatever, they attach it to it. And the other side just go, no, fuck that. We're not doing that. Take that bit out, take that bit out, take that bit out. That's too high. And you just get into this. It's a circus. It's a circus. Mm -hmm. But that AUMF is super important. That's why that's one of the big reasons we are where we are today. Yeah. I was, I, I started reading some Noam Chomsky a, a few months back and he, How's that going? Eh? How's that going? Good insight. Well, I say thought provoking. I don't want to say insightful because it, it that would indicate I believe in everything I'm reading. It's yeah, thought provoking. Yeah. It's thought provoking. And one of his, one of his, uh, one of the things he believes that the US do is that they have uh, an like an ingrained foreign policy um, or interventionist policy where it's in their interests to keep countries keep territories that that are likely or have shown the promise of evolving into self-governed democratic places you know uh or maybe not democratic but self-governed places which could prosper in some way shape or form libya for example uh i don't know where else flipping nicaragua for example you were talking going back in the day it's in the u.s interest to keep those unstable keep them right. destabilized so permanently so, so I think one of the interesting, you know, just 
just drawing off that is the Reagan doctrine back in the 80s. One of the reasons why, why you know, the Reagan doctrine basically was, uh, was the, the idea that the US could prevent the spread of communism around the world. And so that's why you saw the Iran-Contra affair, um, which was effectively Reagan selling arms to the Iranians. Colonel Ollie North was the person, the military guy that was the central figure in that. And then the funds used from the Iranian Contra affair were being used to support the um, Nicaraguan Contra rebels that were trying to topple the government there. And so this doesn't happen through military. This all happens through CIA. And this is the other component of destabilization inside modern contemporary history. And if you look at, if you look at South America, for example, uh, and the destabilization that the CIA have occurred through supporting various groups that are trying to topple governments, all the way through to Afghanistan in the 80s, where the CIA were funneling billions through the Pakistan ISI, which is the intelligence community, into the Mujahideen who were fighting the Soviets at the time. Um, but that money was used by the Mujahideen to develop a, a narcotics business to effectively drug the Russians out. The money was used to provide the Mujahideen with Stinger, Manpads, Manportable, uh, the shoulder launch missiles, which was a, a massive turning point in the war when the Mujahideen started taking down Russian high helicopters in terms of the morale. Um, it's all CIA. And the, and the destructive ability of the and, the, and the and the destabilizing ability of the CIA, it's not just the CIA that do it. I'm sure it's MI6 and Mossad and all these other intelligence agencies, uh, FSB, uh, GRU. Um, it, it's a massively destabilizing component. The military has no, no influence over. In fact, this is one of the things that pisses me off is that, that the power of the, the political side and the power of the intelligence side destabilizes that the military has to try and sweep up the pieces of. Yeah. Uh, and that's the bit that there was an analogy I made when it came to Afghanistan on the Pakistan side. And the destructive influence of Pakistan on Afghanistan that the Americans never gripped basically meant that the military were put in there, you, me, thousands of US, and it was like trying to bail out a boat that had a massive hole in it, a political hole that was never, ever sealed. And it's because the political side was never gripped and the conditions were never set for success. Big chat there, right? Well, two things on that. So, oh, quick questions. The but the CIA, that their ability is there. That isn't as a result of the AUMF, is it? No. What the CIA? So when it comes to drone strikes as well, no one's talking about this. I told you, spoke about it on the BBC. When it comes to drone strikes, there's two ways that the US, two parallel paths that the US can conduct a drone strike. One is through the Pentagon, where the checks and balances are pretty pretty good i used to work inside the kill chain in baghdad I used to be the guy that was responsible for the air assets inside a restricted operating zone of ROS over a target um the checks and balances the approval the collateral damage estimate the weapon selection the fuse selection the bomb damage assessment all of these things occur stringently inside the military approvals process the cia can do what the fuck they want they can do it with no transparency. They can do it with no accountability. And the approvals process is very different. So that just gives you an example of how destructive the CIA can be without having to answer to anyone. And that's why you saw, through the Obama years, you saw the conventional drawdown of troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, but you saw a ramping up of SF capability. You look at the USSF footprint in Africa, it's frightening. And the reason for that is, is that SF... Were you SFSG? No. No. The, the reason for that is, is that the SF don't have to answer to the media. And so they can do what they want without being transparent. And that's what Obama's policy was. Mm -hmm. um, going back to Pakistan, the Pakistan observation, that, that was the, that the, the, the scene for success wasn't set to enable success. Why do you think that is? So I, I look, I, when, sometimes when I look at Iraq, when I look at Afghanistan, when I look at this Middle East stuff, led, and Africa, led by the US, 
it seems to me like there was never any intention to succeed. It's based on different political agendas. Where, where was where was Osama bin Laden found? Pakistan, wasn't it? <laughs> Abbottabad, which is on the outskirts of the Pakistan's equivalent to West Point. How fucking nuts is that? When the US launched the raid from Jalalabad, which is in Nangarhar province, I think, on the eastern side near the border, they never told the Pakistanis they were coming because they knew the Pakistanis would inform people that knew Osama bin Laden. The Haqqani network. The Haqqani network is basically an extension, a military arm of the Pakistan ISI. And the Haqqani network has been, tar has been targeting NATO forces inside Afghanistan ever since they arrived. You know, it, the Pakistan ISI chief is in Kabul right now. And he's there because he's helping coordinate, this is Mikey's assessment, he's helping coordinate Taliban attacks on the National Resistance Front in Panjshir province, which is the only province that hasn't fallen to the Taliban. You know? So maybe the uh, the longer game was played by Pakistan. The longer uh, game was just just the longer game was just leave Afghanistan alone. Attack <laughs> the short game was attack the Al Qaeda tam, at camps, get the ODA in there, get SF in there to put bombs onto the target, um, knowing that they were going to flee into Pakistan anyway, and just just prevent the use of Afghanistan as a training ground for 9/11 style attacks. Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda in Yemen, they're the people that have got the mandate to attack the West, AQAP. You know, that's, that's a, you know, what's been done about Yemen. Yeah, the US don't give a shit about Yemen. The Saudis have been, you know, bombing the Houthis in Yemen for the last seven years. Why aren't the US interested in that? That's where AQ, AQAP is. Could it be a case that, that, that that's where the, you know, that's where the main, if that's where the legitimate threat is. It could it be a case that because of the time spent in Afghanistan, uh, that campaign there and all the different sacrifices made in various forms from human to financial, you know, um, that the that it's the case of they're having to try and not save face, but make it look as if it's more important than it than it, it than it actually was Afghanistan because of the because of the, the public uh, the public opinion on it, you know, if we all of a sudden switch priorities. Yeah, I mean, the problem with Afghanistan was is that when, when military activity started occurring in Afghanistan in 2001, literally, you know, weeks after 9-11 occurred, in 2003, George W. Bush then decided he was going to go and invade and occupy Iraq. I was part of that invading force. I'm not proud of that, but I was. We started oh, off. Yeah. We, we start. Were you were you there as well? Yeah. yeah. We, so we started off in Ali Al Salem. Was training there for two months, and then, um, sometime in March, can't remember when it was. Was it we got the order to go in, and that's when we went into Basra and started operating out of Al Um But the amount of the amount of force structure and capability that it took to do Iraq took everything away from Afghanistan. And so Afghanistan was put on the back burner because you can't do two large scale operations, sustaining, enduring operations. Um, Brits didn't have a capability to do that. And the Americans realized pretty soon they didn't have a capability to do that. And when things started going wrong in Iraq, which they did pretty quickly, when the power vacuum was created, you know, you go, and this is the big thing about, you know, what we just haven't learned is you don't go into countries and create power vacuums. It's what we did. And, and, and we did it in Iraq. We took out Saddam's complete 400,000 strong uh, security structure. Um, and then we allowed, you know, the likes of Sakawi and AQI to start thriving. I mean, ISIS was born from AQI. Al-Qaeda in Iraq turned into Islamic State in Iraq, turned into Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And the reason... You know, one of, the, one of the fundamental building components of the Islamic State were three men. Haji Baka, who was a strategic mastermind, al sakawi who was the leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq, and al-Baghdadi, who became the religious head of the Islamic State. 
You know where those three people got together? Camp Booker, US POW camp just outside of Baghdad. That's where they, that's where they hatched all of these plans. So what we haven't learned is stop creating power vacuums. And what is so frustrating about Afghanistan is, is that the US and the UK spent 20 years building up an Afghan national army and an Afghan national police with billions of dollars fueled into the capability. You know, and we're talking things like special mission wing. We're talking about Abad mates that were, that were teaching Afghan air crews how to fly MI-17s on counter-narcotic and counter-terrorism. You know, you will have had friends that have mentored Afghan national special forces, tremblers, fours, threes, you know, in how to get where they are today to provide some semblance of, of, of security inside the country. All that's gone to rat shit because of a negotiated deal in Doha by the Trump administration that effectively sidelined the government of Afghanistan and, and sidelined all of that capability that had been built up over the last 20 years. And there's your power vacuum. And the and Biden... Sorry, go on. Go on. No, and the Biden administration's massive catastrophic area, error was not ensuring that the Taliban had that power sharing agreement with the government of Afghanistan before they agreed to withdraw. So there's a Elab- on both sides. Elaborate on the Doha agreement that Trump made. Elaborate. The Doha, so, so Trump and Pompeo, as the Secretary of State at the time, it was, it was Pompeo's lead, basically met with the Taliban in Doha to negotiate the terms of withdrawal and handover, but didn't invite Afga- Ashraf Ghani's GOA, government of Afghanistan, to the talks. And so the Doha agreement basically said, once you leave here, Taliban, you go and have a chat with the government of Afghanistan and negotiate some sort of you know, power sharing stuff. But that never happened. And the Biden administration should have turned around to the Taliban and said, we ain't going anywhere until you've negotiated some form of power sharing agreement with the government of Afghanistan. By the way, we're happy to be the mediator if you want us to do that. Never happened. And if, we'd have, if, if that had have happened, then you'd have had the GOA security structures, the Afghan National Army, Afghan National Peace, it could have been, could have been pulled on to achieve or, or, or not produce a power vacuum. How did the Taliban manage that sweep through in such rapid time? Because... <laughs> Why are you grinning at me like that? Go on. Because <laughs> it's simple. <laughs> and this is the bit that I just don't get, where people are going, oh, my God, wow. Uh, what a surprise that is. It's not a surprise. If you're a tribal elder in Helmand province or in Herat or in Orisgun, all you care about is making sure you've got a good relationship with the people that are going to be in power, enduring power. As soon as the coalition... And the U.S. mentioned they were going to withdraw. The tribal elders are all right. All right. Cheers, mate. Taliban, how are you? Come in, sit down. Uh, how, can we, um, how can we help you? How can we facilitate this? Look, these are my guys here. Don't want anyone injured. I know you guys are keen for a bit of power. So what do you want? Tea, coffee? Do you want to help you grow your opium? What, just tell us what you want because the U.S. aren't going to be here. That started happening months ago. Negotiations. Terms of handover to started up in months before when the US decided they're going to withdraw. It's the way that the tribes work. And who can follow them? But it's fucking beyond naive for people in the State Department for America and the UK and Boris to turn around and go, yeah, I fucking didn't see that coming. Come on. So what are they playing at then? Because it is... Who? 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 What's who playing at? As, you know, because you can make the argument that we lost our sort of um, I-star capability, our surveillance capability, intelligence capabilities when, when the drawdown started happening, when the UK drawdown happened, and then when the US drawdown started happening. You know, so on the, the fringes of the network that you, you lost the ability to see what was going on. But that's like a shell of an argument. So we must have known. I mean, I think you got, I think if you're, if you're someone who is, who is charged with understanding 
understanding the way that you should impose a defence capability. Right? If you're a minister and you're not you're not on top of that, then fucking should be sacked. But this is the problem. We go back to this democratic conversation. Like, how many times has a Secretary of State been nominated as, sorry, how many times has a Secretary of Defence or a Defence Secretary been nominated? This just come from the education, you know, or transport, or basically someone that has no idea whatsoever about the way the military runs. Johnny Mercer, get him in there. Defence Secretary. Guy who, who, who respects veterans, who's been fighting for veterans, understand the way that it works. You know, you, going back to the continuity piece, you need someone that knows, knows the way that the, that the levers of, of power inside the MOD work. That's one piece. And then the other piece possibly is what Phil Ingram alluded to and he came on a few episodes ago, and is that the information being passed from the MOD, of, of, yeah, from the military to the government ministers is inaccurate and it's it's they're being told what they want to hear as opposed to what is actually the truth in the ground in which case it doesn't matter who you've got as, as the minister yeah it's going to so be a- this is really this is this is this is i'm glad you i'm glad you kind of touched upon that when we were on prelim operations do you remember who the uh back in 2005 the i, I don't know whether he was defense minister or whether he was the was it was the Defence Secretary. Do you remember John Reid? Do you remember, yeah. his, com- you remember his comment about 3,000 troops? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, no, 3,000 troops and not a shot fired in anger kind of thing. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Now, that is all you need to... St- that is all the example you need of the complete misunderstanding that, that political ministers have over the way that insurgencies and counterterrorism work. We were on prelim ops. Gordon Messenger was capped at three thousand, and he was banging on the door, going, "If I can need a lot more than three thousand to do what you want to do inside Harman Province." Oh, how really? Many troops, okay. How, how many troops are in there? You know, how many troops did he get up to? You know, over ten thousand in the end. Didn't it? So why was it not being granted him? Why were they not? Why was he not being listened to? A complete misunderstanding at the political level of what. Of, of what it actually would require in order to provide security inside Hamilton Ponds. That's my takeaway. But whose is the responsibility lie to get them to understand? CDS or VCDS. But that's that's where, you know, if you're, I, I, I've never operated at those levels. You have to get Gordon Messenger on to talk about that. But, you know, that's part of the skill set, the personality skill set of being able to persuade someone at the political level that the decisions they're making are either a going to cost lives or setting up the conditions for failure. And how do you do that without making them look stupid? How do you do that without being a threat? How do you do that without ostracizing yourself? How do you do that without losing trust? That is a personality trait. And I guess it, you know, it, dovetails into that that question on leadership and you know how do you get people to do things that you want to do that they don't want to do you know it's all of those things but ultimately at the end of the day Hugh it's political agendas and if the advice being given doesn't fit the political agenda the campaign agenda the agenda to for that political party to be able to tell their electorate what they're doing to be able to secure their vote for the next election ain't going to happen Do you think that with, you know, we've talked about how short the terms are with, well, various positions in government and obviously the Prime Minister. Um, I'm running out of coffee. I'm running out of coffee. This is oh, our... Yeah. We're, yeah. We're, nearly, we're, we're, we're nearly done. Well, yeah. We're, oh, we're I'm done. enjoying it. It's great. <laughs> I've got enough coffee in my veins now. It'll last me like 72 hours. <laughs> uh, do you think that um, the intervention list policy overseas you know foreign policy is that's an easier thing to look at changing because it because it's not because it's not in terms of how in terms of benefit to to us uk right for that for the the way we've been going about business um overseas 
it's not compatible. That interventionist sort of approach isn't compatible with, I don't think, with the way politics is set up, with, with the way government is set up, right? Governance is set up here in the UK. So one of them needs to change, potentially. So what yeah what do you think about that is, is our should our foreign policy be, be changed drastically to marry up with what is realistically achievable with the way we're governed so as as british military um we were quoting class rich here on war good read we were an extension of politics by other means and what that means is, is that when soft power fails, you have hard power to resort to, the big stick, the military. When diplomacy fails, you turn to the military. Okay. In 2010, I was part of the SDSR, the Strategic Defense and Security Review. And the way that works is the State, keep calling it State Department, the FCO basically set out their foreign policy agenda, and then the military takes that foreign policy agenda and then builds capabilities through large, medium, and small-scale uh, fighting forces on a non-enduring and enduring basis. Non-enduring being up to, six, up to six months, enduring being more than six months. And then, you, you know, for a large scale, you need this amount of brigades, this amount of air power, this amount of ships, this amount of commandos. Small scale, obviously less. And the way it's supposed to work is, is that the military, the MOD dovetails into providing security apparatus for those foreign policy um, goals. The way it works in reality is, is the government says to the defense secretary, you've got a budget of 32 billion, or whatever it is, make it work. So the point being is, is that Foreign policy can say one thing, the military will always be overextended in order to try and achieve whatever that wants to do. It won't be set up for the conditions of success. Even though they say, how many times have you heard, heard the expression smaller, more versatile, more flexible, more agile? It's bullshit. Because you cut down to a certain amount and then below that, you start to lose effectiveness. So going back to your question, um, it's egos in both departments. It's people wanting to puff their chests out and say, you know, we've got to be able to, you know, at the, the, the FCO level, we've got to be able to do this in Afghanistan. We've got, we've got to do this in Iraq. We want to be able to have influence here, 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 and here. You know, the reality is, is that when it boils down to it and you get the crisis response, whether it's a war fighting crisis response or disaster relief and humanitarian assistance, the military will always be asked to do things that they're, they've not, they've not been um, capability-wise, they've not been um, built up to, uh, to succeed in. And that's why I have just nothing but respect for the military, because as you know, you two power are put into Kabul in very uncertain conditions, um, and the military will always dig out, and we're brilliant at crisis response, and that's what we're trained in, uh, and we'll always, we'll always succeed, even at the cost of lives. Um, I've got a dog barking in the background. Um, so, you know, that, that's the sad thing about it, is the likes of you and me were prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice. We signed on the dotted line to make the ultimate, ultimate sacrifice. But having left 10 years ago, I can't honestly put my hand on the heart and say, did the politicians have our best interests at heart when they were deploying us to these places? And that makes me sad. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think. Yeah, but then I think the bigger question is: Did we have a positive, lasting impact? You know, because it, because the goalposts changed so many times in terms of what we were trying to achieve out there. Was the reason we went in the first place? Is there any, like war on terror, two thousand and one? What was the objective? What we were trying to achieve? Was it for the right reasons? When we be in the West, right? Um, I've but had positive could, feedback on Kosovo. Or... Okay. I did two tours in Kosovo, and I, I recently met... In fact, but that was before the war on terror, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was two... Yeah. I did two tours in Kosovo in 2000. 2000 and 2001, before I, the... I, 
I wasn't sorry. I'm not talking. I'm not talking about knocking off indigenous policy. I, I was, what I was talking about is the war on terror. Yeah. In terms, you know, it, it, because if you can ignore, not ignore. If you set aside, okay, did we achieve all the, what we go in there to aim to achieve? Well, the, you you ask the question. Well, what were we trying to achieve? And it changed so many times. Um, but then, if you ask the question, is are the places I served in this case Iraq, Afghan? Are they for the better because we went there or Fuck. not or not absolutely. or not? Yeah, absolutely fucking not. Absolutely not. You know, 600,000 Iraqi civilians have been killed as a consequence of foreign intervention inside their country. Now, you can, you know, you can argue Saddam was a, was a, a dictator with a, with a brutal stick. Yeah, of course he was. But would 600,000 people have been killed if he'd have still been still been in power, he had no weapons of mass destruction. So, Afghanistan. You know, I, I tweeted out the other day that if if you look if you look at the current government inside Afghanistan and who it's made up of, Taliban leaders, most of them are on UN terrorism lists, and some of them have five million dollar bounties on their heads. You know, if you were to have that conversation in 2002 to the US or to the UK governments and go, right, you're going to invest $3 trillion. You're going to put thousands of men and women into this place. You're going to have thousands that die. You're going to spend millions on equipment capability. Um, this is probably going to suck the life out of your military for the next 20 years. What you're going to get for that is um, you're going to get the guy that you've been after for 20 years. He's going to go into the top spot in Afghanistan. You're going to have two deputy prime ministers yeah, they're on terrorism lists as well. But you know what? We'll forget about that for the moment. And the bloke that you had a $5 million bounty on um, for 10 years and you never caught, uh, he's going to be the defence secretary. Cool deal? <laughs> Fuck you. are having a laugh, aren't you? And, right. and, and people have the audacity to go, mm, did, we, did, did we succeed in Afghanistan? Oh, I never asked that question. I never, I know we didn't succeed, but we don't know what we're trying to achieve is the first fucking thing, you know. I mean, you've I got know. to look at from a military perspective, you've got to look at it within the bubble, right? Did you go out there? Did you do what you were asked to do with the best intentions? And did you succeed in your daily, in your daily mission? And, and it, it, you know, any of the points that I'm raising are not military focused. They are politically focused. And sometimes it doesn't matter how good the military are, if the political condition, as I said earlier about the boat, if the political conditions aren't set, the military are set up for failure, irrespective of how good they are. And we know that because America has a $750 billion defense budget, the most sophisticated air power in the world, and it still couldn't beat back the Taliban and prevent them from holding territory. So... You're absolutely right. You touched on something there. You know, it's when you start, the higher and higher and higher you go in terms of trying to uh, validate whatever you did, wherever you were serving and, and people didn't come back, etc. It's the wrong way of going about it. It's like trying to validate your whole life. You know, you, you're not going to be able to do that. But if you if you were out there, wherever it was, and, and acted in the most moral and ethical way and you you achieve what you you, you were supposed to achieve on that, patrol that mission that op and you you know you, the, and, and the place for however short or long a time while you were there wherever you were was better off for you being there um however you want to measure that then then absolutely bang on bang on for being there on, on the on the you know on the, on the in the short term and that's the only way i think on a personal level because people you know are, are, some people are struggling with this i think that's the only way in a personal level you can uh, you can rationalize it and that's the way i've done it in the past when you know because the question gets asked more and more to people who have served over there by joe blogs you know do you think it was worth it do you think it was worth it you know it's, it's, a, it's a common thing um there's one important uh, thing though to you as well which, and this is incumbent on us as not military operators, but as human beings that have been put into these countries, as human beings that have looked into the eyes of elderly men and women inside Afghanistan or Iraq, or smiled at young children inside Iran, Iraq or Afghanistan. I say that because they're my experiences and they're your experiences. 
we have the ability to be able to convey a message of humanity in that. We have the ability to be able to say, you know what? Being with Afghan people are some of the most generous, genuine people that you'll ever meet, even though you can't speak the same language. The most hospitable people you could ever meet. Some of their cultures we could learn a lot from. Some of their cultures I personally have learned a lot from. And so when, when there are troops who have been to hell and back, and I'm sure are going to hell and back, and have the scars to prove it and the wounds to prove it, you know, I, I would say take away if you can, a little bit of a silver lining here, which is, you may not know it, but maybe for a moment, you brought a little bit of joy into someone's life on the ground in that place. Someone that was curious about the color of your skin, was curious about your smile. And that to me, you, you asked me earlier on about sort of the values that you hold strong, is, is that through compassion and through humanity and through looking outwardly, you can, without even knowing it, affect for the greater good, the lives of people who may only just briefly meet you for a moment. And I guarantee you, a lot of the troops and a lot of the servicemen and women that went into Iraq and Afghanistan will have done that at some point. Bang on, bang on, completely agree. Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure and we definitely need to do it again. Definitely need to yeah. do it again. It's been you, awesome, you Scratch the surface of even your, your uh, extensive history of all sorts of shit and um before the interview i i went on your website to, just to flip and remind myself of certain things but i still haven't watched the documentary with your brother i need to watch that i need to watch that and there's some it, new content on there as well yeah it's not it's um it's with a global it's called my artistic big brother and me and it was on the it was on bbc wales and i just wanted to get my mum's story out there um I spent four years chasing my brother up the hills of Snowdonia. Fucking hell. It's nearly killed me. And then I kind of just used the editing of the film and the, and the making of the film to get better. You know, it's like in the military, you, know, you don't sit on your laurels, do you? You're like, I mean, one of the things that we're taught is you're constantly evaluating your performance and you never really pat yourself up on the back. You're just like, all right, that was a bit of shit. Let's try and figure out how we do that better. And that's, the, that's what I just applied to filmmaking. Self-taught. And I got the film on the BBC. It's with a global distribution company now because the BBC only paid for three airings. And then, and then it, it, so I'm hoping that it gets picked up by um, Discovery Plus. If it doesn't, breaking news, you get the scoop on this, Houston. Uh, I'm about to talk to the global distributor. It's been with them for about a year now. No, more than that, two years. And I know we've had COVID. But if they don't, if they don't manage to get a good distribution of it around the world, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it back and then uh, I'm going to put it on a certain platform and then I'm just going to let it free to the world. So anyone can either come onto my website or whatever and just, just watch it. It's about, it's about 50 minutes long. Um, and I'm going to try and do that for um, Autism Month, which is April uh, next year. I'm going to try and line it up for that. So um, I'll probably come back to that for a bit of exposure, maybe tweet the link out or whatever, and we can even, we can even talk about it on this again uh, a little bit later on. But social impact filmmaking is where I'm at now. It's super important. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah I, I'd love you to see it. It's, um, it's the most important piece of work, including my military service, that I'll ever do. Cool. Yeah, I will. I'll watch it this week. It'll be a pleasure. An absolute pleasure. Uh, website is Mikey K K A Y at uh, Mikey K dot com. Twitter, you are Mikey K M Y C, as in New York City. Instagram, you on Instagram? Say Mikey K M Y C Instagram. Are you, are you, are you TikToking? <laughs> are you? So no way. No, I dabbled in it once, and then for about. <laughs> A day. It's like no way. It's not happening, man. Did you dabble um, in it? Did you dabble in it and put put like a little tune to whatever you were doing? No. Uh, do you know what? My daughter offered to do it for the podcast. So I'll put some clips on. She lost interest after um, <laughs> po post the post one. So yeah. Anyway, listen. I'll catch you soon. And thank you for your time, mate. Really appreciate it. All the pleasure. Cheers, Maka. Cool. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if 
you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of Hey Hour. Becoming a patron of Hey Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to... Uh, exclusive interviews which I do with each guest that last about five ten minutes that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H Hour have chosen and each guest this one included gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded it's like a pre-podcast interview lasts about 10 minutes and those interviews are really insightful really enjoyable nice and short and they only release the patrons they never get released to the public I don't know why I had a little stutter there um you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N, patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.